Okay, so does this work? Does the lecture work? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, great. So, Padiaga, welcome to today's panel on Armenia's Velvet Revolution after six months. My name is Lisa Gulaserian, and as lecturer on Armenian at Harvard and chair of today's panel, I offer my welcome also on behalf of our events organizing partners, the National Association for Armenian, Armenian Studies and Research, and the College School Bankian Foundation that has supported Nasser's series on contemporary Armenian issues for the past two years. Today's event was also made possible by the co-sponsorship of HEBU Young Professionals Boston, the Electoral Reform Society Student Organization at the Harvard Kennedy School, and the Harvard Armenian Students Association. So thank you again to these organizations and everyone who had a hand in uh, working on today's program. I find it fitting that today's event is being presented to a packed crowd, pretty packed, in Harvard's Fong Auditorium because just two years ago, Nasser hosted a panel at Harvard on Armenia's parliamentary elections as part of its contemporary Armenian issues series. Tonight's event continues Nasser's commitment to covering important topics in today's global Armenian diaspora. Over the past four years, Nasser's contemporary series has addressed a wide range of topics, many of which are major issues that led to the dramatic events of the Velvet Revolution this past spring that resulted in the departure of Serge Sarkisian and the assumption of power by Nigol Pashinyan. These topics include the electoral process, corruption, the conflict in Gharapal, women's empowerment, and economic development, to name just a few. Given our focus in prior events on the precursors and catalysts for the Velvet Revolution, it seemed necessary this fall to take stock of where we are almost six months later. And tonight's program is the first of three that will take place over the next month here in Boston, in New York, and in Washington, D.C. Although we know very well it's too soon to draw any conclusions, it's never too soon to shed light on where we stand. Our program tonight aims to assess the Velvet Revolution that seems to have transformed Armenia and our, opinion, our opinions of the country. To this end, tonight's program will run as follows. Each panelist will be introduced in both English and Armenian by one of my students before the panelist de delivers a short prepared remark. We'll begin with Anna Ohanian, then move to Harut Manukian and Anush Hamtarian. After each panelist has spoken, I will briefly invite them to answer my questions before opening up the floor to questions from you, the audience. Our program will end promptly hopefully, fingers crossed, at 9 p.m., wherein we will invite you to join us outside, just right outside those doors, for refreshments. I'm looking forward to tonight's rousing discussion, so let's begin. Our first panelist is Anna Ohanian, who will be introduced by Mary Galstian. Mary. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have all of you here tonight. Uh, so, Anna Ohanian is the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College. Her latest book, Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond, is an edited volume that was published a few weeks ago by the Georgetown University Press. She has written a variety of articles for the Washington Post, Al Jazeera, and Foreign Policy Magazine, among other academic journals and media outlets. Anna Ohanyana Stonehill Hama Sarani, Kahakadan Kiduchan, Yemichas Kain Hara Peduchuneru, Richard B. Finnegan Dikosi Professore. Ohanyani Vechin Kampakrutuna, Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Post Communist Eurasia and Beyond, Kani Mushapadara Chiradara Gvetav, 
Georgetown համաստարանի խմբակրադան գողմ է։ Ան պազմաթիվ հոտվածներ կրած է Washington Post, Al Jazeera, Foreign Policy բարպիրաթերթերուն և այլ ակադեմագան որաթերթերուն և մամուլներուն համար։ Սիրերի հանդիսադես եկեք սիրով բողջունենք Անա Ոհանյան։ So very much. Oh, um, thank you so very much. I'm really touched by the introduction into languages. I have been introduced in English. I've been introduced in Eastern Armenian, but I've never been introduced in such sweet, beautiful Western Armenian. <laughs> because we have some exciting speakers on a panel who have a very unique and important perspective to share. So I'm going to, uh, I will focus on two basic questions. Um, what is the Velvet Revolution? What is the identity of it? Um, and where did it come from? Because these two questions are quite important in telling us as to where we're headed. And let me just start by saying that as a community, as a community in Armenian community here, Armenia, as well as in Armenia, um, we are still reflecting on what happened in Armenia. Academic community also uh, didn't quite, uh, hasn't yet had time to fully digest, understand, and place this revolution in the uh, in a very important place where it belongs. Um, as well as globally, the significance of the Velvet Revolution in the region, as well as uh, globally, considering that right now democracies are declining, uh, democracies that uh, are uh, established and consolidated are losing their quality, uh, con countries, political systems that are stuck in between are moving towards authoritarianism. So what happened in Armenia is significant, is very special and very exciting. Um, the first quick lesson is that uh, the Velvet Revolution has important lessons for countries that are demo aspirant democratizers, countries that are stuck in between, and countries that are stuck in geographical neighborhoods between, uh, between competing geopolitical powers, uh, which have already proven a tendency to derail uh, democratic trans transitions. And very often, even in Armenia, the identity of this revolution continues to be debated. Often authoritarian forces will try to depict it as a color revolution, the implication being that this was something orchestrated from abroad. Uh, Soros is a dirty word in Armenia. I was really surprised to find all of this out in Armenia. So let me just say, sim say simply, velvet is not a color. And what happened in Armenia is not a color revolution. But then what is it? Um, in terms of its key attributes, um, it was a peaceful, non-violent, mass-scale protest. And I have spoken on this on several occasions, but the importance of this, that this was mass-scale, civil disobedience, this are, the, uh, so, these two are essential attributes for the Velvet Revolution. Um, some of the important attributes because they will translate into long-term consolidation of democracy. Let me simplify this. Because it has been a mass-scale civil disobedience, that means, uh, in kind of explaining it more simply and not relying on political science jargon, <laughs> I apologize, is that this was a mass-scale mobilization of a large number of people, 150,000 people on the streets. And uh, largely in contrast to some of the color revolutions, uh, this movement did not develop top down. This was the result of decades long um, civil society uh, 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 initiative, peace, peaceful protests. And because it was so intimate, because it was so participatory, uh, this is set to translate into civil society engagement. Data of the numerous cases, case after case, a large and uh, large number of uh, case studies around the world, uh, we call it high-end data, indicates that when revolutions happen, 
uh, or tr just such big democratic transitions happen, the biggest danger that democratic transitions face is when people go home. And then they demonstrate, they topple the dictator, they go home, and then a year or two later, you're stuck with either another authoritarian or someone that is worse, that is uh, even more authoritarian than the one you just deposed. And the reason is simple, that when people go home, they do not engage the, the change, the, the possibility of an, of an authoritarian reversal is very high. So in that respect, I'm really excited as to how this transition unfolded, that it was so intimate, just watching young women um, close streets, I do not think I would have the guts to do it. It has been um, incredibly humbling to watch uh, what some of these women did, uh, as well as men, I should highlight. Uh, but I, uh, we can go, yeah, I'll be happy to get into the gender issue later on. Um, the second key attribute that is of crucial importance that the transition unfolded in two tracks. It unfolded in the streets, mass mobilization in the streets, but also through the formal institutions, flawed but formal institutions. Political science theories tell us that political institutions matter, right? The parliament, the presidency, the judiciary, all of that. But now other scholars are arguing that social, social basis of the revolution are as important. In the case of Armenia, the transition developed in these two tracks. And I have a lot of respect uh, for Nikol Pashinyan for uh, leading the movement in this dual track sticking to the institutions, and right now he's an institutional hostage to an authoritarian parliament, and he does not have a lot, a lot of institutional levers to, uh, to call for a snap election. So I'm hoping we can talk about that. But the fact that this unfolded in flawed but formal way is really critical, and this is related to the third component, a third signature of this movement, that it pushed or played out in terms of the uh, kind of the push and pull, the tango I'm calling it, between authoritarian forces and the reformers. Um, and in that respect, this transition is a lot more similar, has a lot more Latin flavor, like in Brazil, Chile, Peru, Argentina, much more so than the color revolutions in neighboring Georgia or Ukraine or uh, the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan. Now, that's as to what it is in terms of the identity uh, of, the, of this transition. Few words on where it come from. In contrast, uh, similar to uh, many of the Latin American transitions, this did not happen overnight. Very often, the taxi drivers in Armenia would say, would express shock as to how, did, where did this come from? Is uh, their, their conspiracy theory swirling? Uh, this was too easy. Like, you know, how do you depose a dictator, authoritarian, without a, a single blood uh, shed? And my answer would be, it, was, it, it wasn't sudden, it was not easy. There were uh, cases and attempts, and there were people that actually died in previous uh, cases of uh, attempt at contesting electoral outcomes. But the fact that there seems to be, there have been a learning curve within the civil society uh, is, I think, important to highlight. Now, where did it come from? So, in, in sharp contrast to Latin American transition, where the, uh, the, the reformers had to depose uh, uh, entrenched military regimes, Armenia's was very different. It was very different as to, uh, as, uh, from the color revolutions because this was Armenia's second attempt, in a way, at democratic transitions. This was not a uh, kind of post-Soviet, uh, we have been there, done that, what Armenian reformers have done, they have went ahead, head to head, uh, against an authoritarian, in political science, Armenia would be has been classified for decades as a competitive authoritarian regime and stable at that, stable competitive authoritarian regime. Meaning that um, these kinds of systems that emerged in big waves after the end of the Cold War, with the collapse of the Cold War when everyone was excited, where the countries, the new post-Soviet states are transitioning, they're going to become consolidated democracies with fully developed market economies, that's not where they transition. Most of the countries transitioned into these political systems that are, uh, that, that are a mix of uh, uh, authoritarian uh, as well as democratic uh, regimes. So at the core, they were authoritarian systems, but they would use democratic mechanisms 
uh, to stay in power. So as many hybrid regimes, similar hybrid regimes, Armenia also was such. So meaning that elections were happening, and we have an expert who will talk about that. I'm not going to talk about the importance of the, import the importance of elections, participating in fraudulent elections. And Nasser, again, last year in Didliza, organized the, uh, the forum on parliamentary elections, and many people from that audience went to Armenia, observed elections, along with my student from Stonehill College, who was in Armenia at the time. She also served as an uh, election observer then. So um, this kind of regimes practice electoral comp uh, 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 practice elections, organize elections. Uh, media is a little bit open. There's, in Armenia, the state media was controlled. And, um, but what is also, in, uh, what I'm trying to say is that this was an authoritarian system trying to legitimize power, legitimize power with democratic mechanisms, but in doing so, this kind of regimes become vulnerable. So um, with this, I will, let me just throw just one last argument to say that uh, in 1990s, this kind of hybrid competitive regimes in 1990s could be observed in Ghana, Kenya, Mozambique, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Albania, closer to home, Croatia, Russia, Ukraine, Serbia, Haiti, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru. One more statistics, and I will uh, and I will stop. Um, in nine, this kinds of regimes are a lot more vulnerable to democratic transitions and consolidation relative to fully closed traditional authoritarian systems. And the condition for this kind of electoral regimes to, uh, for this kind of hybrid regimes to transition to uh, democratic transitions are much better actually now than they were 20 years ago. One statistics and I'll stop. In 1975 to 89, the likelihood of personalist, personalist authoritarian regime succeeded by electoral democracy was 26%. So fully closed regime, chances of them transitioning to an authoritarian, uh, to an uh, electoral democracy were 26%, and 65% for competitive authoritarian regimes, hybrid regimes, a little bit authoritarian, a little bit democratic. In 1990 to 2004 period, those numbers are 78% for fully closed authoritarian regimes, right? President Ali, watch out and 94% for competitive authoritarian regimes to be succeeded by an electoral democracy. I'll stop here and we'll talk about where this is headed in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, because uh, your fascinating presentation really gave us a global perspective and we heard from Latin America and other uh, other revolutions that we can compare to the Armenian Velvet Revolution. Also, I really think you've got a trademark that velvet is not a color. <laughs> Very <good. laughs> so, so, well, next time we talk, I, I want to hear about that. So, uh, I'm looking forward to asking you some questions, sure. too, about especially gender, because you mentioned the gender issue as something you could return to. So, our second panelist, we'll move on to our second panelist, who is Harut Manugyan who will be introduced by his friend, Julia Kitsilian. Oh. Good evening. Harut Manugyan is a Master in Public Administration student at the Harvard Kennedy School and a very good friend of mine. His focus is in the area of election administration and electoral system design. <clears throat> This summer, he attended sessions of Armenia's Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform and reported on the proceedings for EVN report. All right. And then off. <laughs> <laughs> Inzi Hamar Metz Hadrik A. Nergayat Sinel Im Angeres Harut Manugiana. Haruta Kenada N. A. Yev. Harvard D. Kennedy School, Han Rayin, Barchutian, Marquis Rosagan, Tegna Zu A. Aga Temagan, Heda Kurkutun, Heda Kurkutun Nermen, Megne, Bantrutun Neru, Tidar Guma. Isamar, 
Masnav Tetsa, Hayastanin, Parlament Agan, Shovov Neru, Yev Dereg Akretz, Zanons Masin, Ivianin, Hama. Actually, I'm going to take this mic here so that I can move around a little bit. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you to all the organizers that made this evening possible. Uh, I'm really excited that I get to talk about electoral systems because usually when I talk about electoral systems, people's eyelids start getting heavy and uh, they think that uh, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. Cheer if you think that electoral systems are boring. Okay. Cheer if you think that electoral systems are exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I agree. And notice how I rigged that process to get the outcome that I wanted. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I'm going to be speaking for a few minutes about uh, how you set the rules of the game, uh, how they were set, and uh, what the direction uh, looks like going forward. Uh, so, one of the major reasons that uh, I think this Velvet Revolution succeeded, this is my personal opinion, uh, is the process uh, in which in 2015, when that constitutional uh, referendum happened, Armenia transitioned from a presidential system to a parliamentary system. And in a parliamentary system, you have a reserve power of a ceremonial president, of a parliament that's independent of the president. Uh, and, you know, the president, or, or the, the prime minister, can step down, and there's still people in charge. There's still, uh, there's still a president, there's still a parliament that can choose uh, the next uh, prime minister and set the stage for what the uh, uh, what the process will be for any future election. So, whoever controls the process can have a very big uh, impact on the outcome. Uh, it's very important that they, they study that, that's why I left my uh, job in electrical power systems engineering uh, and came here to study political power systems engineering. Uh, so. Uh, Immediately after Pashinyan was uh, elected as the Prime Minister on May 10th, uh, he said, my first job is to change the electoral code and call snap elections as soon as we can. Because uh, the previous electoral code was written by the previous administration, they had uh, complete influence on uh, what was going uh, to be in it. And, uh, and it was very important that any future election was fought under rules uh, that are going to be, that everyone is going to agree uh, are fair. So it's a very interesting situation where uh, the Prime Minister does not have a majority in the Parliament that needs to pass this law. And the law actually has to pass, I think it's 60%, it might be, it might be two thirds, uh, I think it's 60% of the Parliament needs to agree to change the electoral code. And so, uh, what needs to be changed? What's wrong with Armenia's electoral code? What, what are the issues that we need to fix? Uh, so, uh, I think the 2017 uh, election was a really popular one. I, I also uh, went to Armenia to uh, be one of the election observers. Uh, and, you know, I sat there uh, the whole day from uh, 7 a.m. to past midnight. Uh, and within that poll, things seemed pretty normal. I've, uh, I've been in, uh, I've scrutinied elections in Canada. I've, I've uh, actually, I was also elected as a school board trustee in Canada. I know how elections uh, run. Uh, and this looked pretty close to uh, a Canadian election. I couldn't see. I came home and people asked me, how was the election? And I said, you know what? It seemed pretty normal to me. And what was interesting was how the, uh, what the processes were uh, to kind of 
uh, wiggle through without actually stuffing a ballot box, which has happened in, in, in the past, but uh, not, in, not in my poll in 2017. So uh, later, talking to people this summer, I was with Transparency International uh, and with EVN Report, uh, and, and I learned these legal uh, things that were going on that uh, were a little bit questionable. So first of all, uh, if you need assistance uh, to fill out your ballot, uh, then you're allowed to have someone uh, help you out. There, are, there aren't necessarily accessibility machines like in, in Toronto you can uh, blow into a, a machine to mark your ballot for you uh, without someone else's involvement. They, they don't have those in Armenia, but you can bring someone else. And you know what, I was like, yeah, there are a lot of old grandmas, I assumed there, it was their grandson uh, kind of helped them uh, uh, fill out the, the box, and, and that's perfectly within the rules. Uh, you can uh, register who, who the assistant is, and they're allowed to cast that ballot, and, uh, and that's not illegal. And then I also noticed, uh, so the way, uh, the way the 2017 election worked, it was a little bit different from uh, the past, uh, there used to be an issue called carousel voting. Who's, who's ever heard of that term before, carousel voting? So uh, the way it works is normally uh, you come to the election booth, they give you a ballot, uh, you mark the ballot, uh, and, and you put it into the box. Now if you can take one ballot out of the election booth, uh, out of the polling station, if you can uh, have a ballot, now all of a sudden uh, somebody uh, can give that ballot uh, to the next voter, mark it ahead of time for a certain person, and say, cast this ballot when you go in, and bring me your empty one. And so uh, they go, they do that, they bring the empty one, uh, and you, you mark that one outside, and then you give it to the next person, and it's like a carousel, and that's why it's called carousel voting. Uh, so the 2017 election actually already addressed uh, that issue. So in 2017 it was very different. There were an excess of ballots. There was no shortage of ballots. You want a ballot, uh, there's a whole garbage can full of ballots. You come, uh, there are nine uh, different pieces of paper, uh, one for each party. Uh, you have to take one of each of the nine pieces. You go into the polling station. Uh, and you pick uh, one ballot to put into an envelope, uh, and you throw the rest in the garbage right in the polling station. So let's say someone gave you a pre-marked ballot. Well, now you can go behind that polling station. If you really want to, take the ballot that was pre-marked, put that in the garbage, pick up uh, any other one that you want, or, or you got and you have the nine uh, that you pick up, and you can put whatever you want in that envelope uh, and, and put it into the bin. So, you know, definitely uh, what, the, what the International Election Observer said about the 2017 election was that uh, everything inside the polls uh, were orderly, however, there were people uh, paying uh, bribes to voters to vote their way outside of the polls. So, okay, so now uh, you, you can say this is really uh, the main issue that we need to address. So if someone pays me, uh, whether it's 5,000 to them, I heard the price uh, went up in 2017 uh, to 10,000, 20,000 to them. Uh, if someone pays me that, they want to know that I'm gonna pass the vote that, the way that they want. And if it's an actual secret ballot, you know, I can take their money and vote however I want anyway, and that uh, reduces the whole investment uh, model. So, uh, so what are the ways that, that they make sure people vote the same way? So then I noticed, when you put the envelope, uh, when you put your ballot in the envelope, there's a little corner cut out on the envelope, and the person at the ballot box puts a stamp, uh, and only uh, the ballots with a stamp get counted. So let's say you put two envelope. Yeah, let's say you put two ballots in the envelope. Uh, only the one with the stamp is going to count. So if some other ballots find their way into the ballot box and if they don't have this holographic stamp, uh, then they're not going to get counted. They get thrown out. And you know, sometimes the person working the ballot box 
puts this square stamp square with the corner, and sometimes it's a little bit diagonal. And I thought it was interesting. Uh, I couldn't really explain it. Uh, and potentially, if the person really, if the person working the polls and all of the people working the polls are appointed by the parties uh, with current seats in the parliament, technically, if they know uh, that uh, someone is going to be uh, voting a certain way, maybe they could put in like a check to see maybe all the diagonal votes that should should be for a certain candidate. Really, I, I don't know enough to, to clarify whether that was an actual strategy or not. Uh, but one strategy that was definitely an issue was uh, making markings. So someone gives you a ballot, they say, uh, you know, I want to make sure that uh, you vote the right way, so when you go there, put uh, like an X in the corner or put something uh, on there. Uh, and, and that's going to make me understand that this was your ballot and I paid you and I won't bother you because uh, you did what I asked. Now, uh, they also addressed that in the 2017 election. If there was any marking on that piece of paper, then it's a spoiled ballot. They throw it out, uh, which has uh, a flip side effect that technically, uh, if you have a secret pen or something when you're counting the ballots, you can get some of them thrown out as well. Uh, so, one of the major things that they wanted to do uh, with these electoral system changes was, let's get the pens out of the system. So right now, you get one of the nine pieces of paper. On the back, uh, there's a person uh, running in your local district, and you can uh, vote for that local person. Uh, so it's an open list proportional system. It's very different from the way that we do things in North America. Uh, it's more common in Europe. Uh, so, uh, the, what, uh, one of the proposals was, let's get the pens out. So how can we make a system where there's no pens involved whatsoever? And so, uh, there's, the, the law hasn't been introduced yet, but basically there's not going to be uh, an open list anymore. So originally, this, uh, this really irked me, uh, because uh, I, I don't really want uh, power to be concentrated in, in like a party elite uh, who gets to choose who's in what order uh, on, a, on the party list. But you know what, uh, for the position that Armenia is in right now in its uh, democratic evolution, I think it's a very important uh, step in that process. Uh, so if once we get to the point where everyone uh, completely has faith in the results that are reported, uh, then we can start talking about open lists and STV or other uh, models that are out there. So I talked about whoever controls, uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes, all right. Five total. Because I can talk about electoral system for a really long time. <laughs> Let's take four. <laughs> don't, don't, don't threaten us. So uh, one really interesting thing was, uh, I said whoever controls the process has a big uh, impact on the outcome, right? So uh, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan appointed a 12-person Prime Minister's Special Commission on Electoral Reform. It included the chair of the Election uh, Commission, uh, the head of the police force, a couple electoral system experts. Uh, I got to Armenia too late to be on, on it, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, uh, Anush's supervisor at the Helsinki Citizens Assembly, Bartina Grigorian, was on that commission, and, and my boss at uh, Transparency International, Sona Ibazian, uh, was also on there, so uh, I did get to have an idea of what was going on. Um, so, the day after Pashinyan appointed this 12-person special commission, the day after, the parliament, which was still controlled by the Republican Party, uh, the previous uh, party that used to be run by Sersa Kisian, uh, the next day they said, we're going to have a parliamentary special committee on electoral reform. Uh, and this is going to be an all-party com uh, committee. Uh, there are four parties represented in parliament. All four of them are going to have three representatives. Uh, and we're going to uh, look at this whole electoral reform issue together, and we're going to make 
uh, our recommendations together. And so I was sitting in those parliamentary committee meetings watching them say, all right, now there's this other electoral commission, we need to get the commission members into the room, we need to get them negotiating with us. And so Daniel uh, Ioannisian, who's the, uh, he was the secretary of the special commission, he, uh, he stood there and he said, you know, I'm not a political body, I'm not here to negotiate uh, what I'm going to trade with you. Uh, we're the uh, we're the electoral uh, specialist, Mas uh, We're going to put together a system that we would be proud of, and then after that, it's up to the parliament uh, to pass it. And remember, the parliament is still controlled by the Republican Party. How many over time? All right. I have a lot to talk about during questions. Ask questions about the gender quota, which was increased. Uh, the lower threshold that's going to uh, likely increase the number of parties. Uh, cameras, so uh, in Canada, you're not allowed to take any picture in a polling booth. Uh, in Armenia, since the 2017 election, every single polling station uh, has a video camera. Uh, and that was a question of whether they should continue it. Uh, voter ID is very interesting, especially in contrast uh, to uh, conversations in the United States. Uh, and lastly, I have to mention uh, the on Sunday, who knows what happened on Sunday, please uh, let me know. Okay, there was a big city council election uh, in Yerevan on Sunday. Uh, it was a really big deal. Uh, the Republican Party didn't even contest uh, the election. They didn't even have a, a list uh, on the Yerevan uh, for, for the city council, uh, whichever party gets the most. Uh, gets to appoint the mayor. So the My Step Alliance uh, uh, took 80% of the vote. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Luis Alliance, which is uh, part of, together with Yelk uh, nationally, uh, contested that separately. I hope we get to talk about it. Um, I have a lot to talk about. Please ask me questions about this. Uh, I never get to talk about this with anyone else. <laughs> is pretty contagious, I have to say, because uh, elections, not everyone is as interested as you are, but I think a lot of us were engaged. That was impressive. So thanks for sharing your expertise in Armenia and now here at the Kennedy School. So uh, we will talk, I, I have lots of questions for you, especially about the things you mentioned at the end. Our final panelist tonight is Anush Hamparian, who will be introduced by Danny Donavedian. I'm happy to introduce our next panelist. Anush Hamparian is a master in public policy student at Harvard Kennedy School. Previously, she worked at a human rights organization in Armenia, managing election observation missions and monitoring the situation of human rights defenders. She was among the hundred thousands of people taking part in the Velvet Revolution. This, come, this last spring. Urahem Vortsez Granam Zano Tatsanel Anush Hampariana Inka Hanraim Kalakaganuchian Makis Tosagan Teknazue Harvardi Kennedy Tobrosa Atke Arach Anusha Hayastan Ashtadaze Mart Kain Iravum Neru Gazma Gerbuchun Mamech Hon Garabarets, Undruchun Neru, Tidagum Nerun, Yev Husket, Mark Gain, Iravung Neru, Bashpan Nerun, Irabi Jaga. Hazar Avot Martos Head, Masnak Tetsav, Kardan, Tavashia, Hela Pokuchian. Meds, Zabaharushunma, Anushin Hamar. Um, I, um, I was born and raised up in 
Banazer. It's the first largest city in Armenia, and I was in Banazer doing this uh, during this event. Yes, yes. Or, or maybe move the mic a little bit. Yeah, one of the other microphones. So, yeah, is it better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I grew up in Banazor. It's the first large, largest city uh, in Armenia. Uh, well, uh, it's not actually as large. The population is only like 80,000 people. That's the official number of population, and the real number of population is much lower, probably 30,000 people. Um, and I worked in Armenia during the past three years. I was there during the previous, uh, during the recent... Mm, events in Armenia during the Baal Revolution, and I would very much like to talk uh, about uh, the events in Banazor because um, uh, I think one of the reasons why this revolution was very successful was that um, it was not limited to Yerevan, contrary to the previous, um, uh, previous protests that happened in Armenia after um, certain elections, for example, presidential elections uh, in, in 2008 uh, and parliamentary elections in 2012, presidential elections in 2013. We always had, had post-election developments, but none of them were across across country. But uh, during these protests, um, almost every single village, every single town, and every single city uh, in, some, in some way joined, uh, joined the movement. Um, it was a co cross-country movement supported by all groups, groups of people, and especially young people. And young people had a, a, a major role in those, um, in those events. Uh, but I have to say that in the beginning there was also a, lot, uh, a, a little skepticism, I would say. Um, I remember when Nikol Pashinyan with uh, a few of his supporters started the um, walk uh, in Gyumri. And he was in Banazar a few days late, later after that, uh, and they were passing by our office. Like their 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 way was um, like passing by our office. So we a few colleagues we went out to greet them, uh, but they were very fast. Actually, we couldn't catch up. But <laughs> but people who saw us, they said, "Are you trying to catch up with that group group of people?" And said, "Yeah, we we're trying to catch up." And they were. Um, sympathetic but I would say also like a bit disinterested and it's so interesting now to look back at that moment and to realize that that small group of people is now leading the country <laughs> yeah <laughs> so but the, that, that disinterest changed um, and once Nikol Pashinyan got to Yerevan the, mo the movement started like getting momentum and also the region started joining it uh, the first protests in Banazar started in mid-April, um, and um, initially a handful of students um, went to the city square with posters demanding such circumstances, the previous Prime Minister's resignation, and marching in the streets, calling on other people to join the protests. And by April 23rd, like the number of protesters in Banazar reached two, three thousand people. And it was unprecedented for the city. Like it may sound like a small number of people, but in Vanazar, nothing like that happened before. Even during the um, famous uh, 1988 demonstrations for Nagorno Karabakh, did not involve so many people. So it was truly unprecedented for the city. And also the the types and the forms of civil disobedience were very unique. We had student strikes in uh, schools and colleges, universities. We had labor strikes in factories, shops, even banks. Um, and people, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It was very difficult. People had to overcome um, difficulties to to do that because there was a lot of pressure from. Um, school administration, like university uh, professors, teachers, um, against students who try to participate, and also like bosses of um, factories and shops and all, all businesses uh, that had tied, uh, ties with the previous um, regime and such circumstances administration. So um, obviously that it was not of their interest to let their workers participate in those uh, in that movement. 
but people were very brave, like despite all of the obstacles that they still went to the streets and they still supported Nikola Pashinyan. And I think the reason why uh, Pashinyan was able to garner so much popular support and was able to um, leverage the people's dissatisfaction with the previous regime was that um, he was very persistent which I wouldn't say about the previous oppositional leaders that tried uh, to mobilize people. And people really believed in him. They believed that he would, uh, he would not back down. He would take this process until the end. And it became especially an evidence during the um, short, like, feminine talk between Zer Sarkisyan and uh, Nikol Pashinyan, especially after that, like, people realized that, like, this guy is going to take this process till the end. Um, I would also like to talk about women's participation, uh, and especially in Vanadzor. Uh, to me personally, the moment that I felt uh, the movement was unstoppable, unstoppable and invincible was seeing hundreds of women from a sewing factory marching down the street of, of Vanadzor um, in the morning of April 23rd. And the day before that, Nikol Pashinyan was um, arrested by the National Security Service. And I was afraid that the movement will weaken and slowly, slowly extinct after that. And I remember going to the city, um, city um, square um, on uh, April 23rd and really afraid that I would see fewer people there. And I was so, uh, and I felt so, um, empowered and so proud of those women when I saw like the, the big march, like huge amount of women in the street. I couldn't even see the end of the march. And um, it, it was a truly historic moment, I would say. Uh, and I remember at some point I started going back, like going in the opposite direction of the march, and one of the women said, uh, don't go back. Uh, join us, there is, there is no going back. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, I'm, I'm one of you. Yeah, it, was, it was a very empowering moment to see like, women taking like, such a political stance and, and participating in the movement. Um, and hours after that, Sir Sarkson resigned, and we even had like, an, a, a joke in town that was Sir Sarkson waiting for, uh, for the women from sewing factory to resign. He could have said that earlier, and yeah, people like women would go, um, would, would, would start like, their march earlier. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And um, Sir Sarkson's resignation, uh, resignation was. Um, celebrated in the city, like people were smiling, hugging each other, drinking champagne, congratulating each other. Police officers were smiling like, for the first time in Vanato. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, actually we had a few small clashes with police officers in Vanato as well, but um, they generally um, obeyed the order, the orders, and tried sometimes tried to hinder the protest, protest to stop the protest. But uh, you will also hear like f phrases uh, showing hidden support. I would say, like I remember talking to uh, a police officer and uh, saying that the people are just exercising their constitutional right to freedom of assembly. They are just expressing their dissatisfaction and they are saying what they need to say. And the, person, uh, the police officer said, well, we have a lot to say as well. It's just, like, this is what it is. Um, and now there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion and conversation about uh, the sustainability of changes that this movement uh, brought about. And the reason why I believe that this process is irreversible is that it brought about psychological change. Like, before these people... Uh, People thought that their voices did not matter. They thought that they could do nothing about the non-democratic regime and the corrupt regime in Armenia. And many people just left the country, like to other developed countries. But now people really believe that this was their victory. They believe that they made this happen and they can unite. They have the power to dictate politics in Armenia. Uh, 
And they made it very clear that they will no longer tolerate a non-democratic regime in Armenia. And I very much appreciate what Anna said about like a velvet uh, revolution being a purely Armenian revolution. As someone, as is someone who participate in that, can uh, can can say that it's absolutely true. Like people in Armenia believe that like they did it and they own it. And now there's there's a lot of hope in Armenia, and you would hear a lot like in the streets, people in public places, like people saying, "Yeah, it seems like it's it's going to change. It's it's going to get better, and it's very exciting." Thank you. personal experience in Manazo. I really can't wait to hear more. Uh, luckily, I don't have to wait long because it's time for me to ask some questions of the panelists. And then right after I have a few questions, we will open the floor to the audience. So we'll start with a question from me. Uh, so I'd like to put the three of you in conversation with one another in my questions. So you're welcome to chime in uh, to answer any questions that I pose. Also, is it okay that I'm here? You guys, I, I'm going to be using this one. Okay, so I'll start with a global question for the three of you. Given that our promotional materials for tonight's panel stated that we would attempt to move beyond the headlines to discuss some key fundamental issues, including systemic and salt structural changes that must take place to strengthen Armenia's democracy, what do each of you think is the most critical change that must be made by the new administration, and have you noted any efforts towards that change that must be made in the, in the past six months? So I know maybe how to, you, you can start because we did hear a little bit about some of your, your main uh, interest, of course, is probably what you might want to talk about and what you've seen. Certainly. Um, so one very interesting thing was, uh, I'm sure like uh, many of you here in those late days in April, uh, you know, we heard there was a protest, uh, it's growing day by day, but Originally, we weren't really sure which way this was going to go. There had been protests in the past, there had been water cannons, there had been, in 2008, uh, killings. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was sort of a tense situation. I remember I was in exams and every day it didn't help that from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m. I was watching these live streams. Um, but I think what really uh, helped uh, through this process was when those women, when those moms came with their kids in the strollers to join the protest, I think that invoked a very powerful image in the Armenian psyche of, uh, of the Armenian women marching uh, through the Armenian genocide. And if, if those police forces, if those security forces had harmed any of those Armenian children, uh, I'm sure you saw the, the picture of the kid with his toy cars blockading the street. Uh, I think this made it, you know, you know sometimes uh, young men unfortunately are, are expendable, we're the ones that uh, go to the wars and uh, get violent at protests and, and pay the price for it. Uh, but I think a, a, a very important aspect was the, the role uh, of Armenian women uh, in this uh, revolution, and in terms of uh, what's the most important structural change, uh, I get, I'm glad I get to talk about it, uh, was the, the gender quota rule uh, in the Armenian election. So uh, currently in those lists there was a rule that uh, one, in every, uh, one in every four uh, names uh, has to be, a, you can't have four names in a row of the same gender. So if you have a list of one, two, three, four, the way it, it, the way it turned out in 2017 was uh, there would be three males and the fourth would be a female, three males, the fourth would be a female. Uh, but it could have it was the law applies the other way as well that you can't have uh, four women in a row either. So that got tightened to one in three. Uh, so now. Uh, uh, also, because the territorial lists uh, were eliminated, 
the new Armenian parliament, whenever that election is, it could be as early as November, it could be uh, May or perhaps uh, later than that, but the next Armenian parliament is guaranteed to be 33% minimum uh, women. And having that uh, representative, uh, having the parliament at least more closely represent uh, the people of the country uh, and the the challenges that uh, everyday people go through, I think is going to be a very transformative uh, impact. Wow. Wow. Great. Thank you. So again, I'll just repeat the question, which is, what, it, what do you think is the most critical change that must be made by the new administration, and have you noted any efforts towards making that change in the past six months? Again, I only ask because I want to as Nasser, uh, I want us to keep the commitments that we make on our promotional materials. So, <laughs> so, so we're going to answer this question. If it takes all night. If it takes all night, <laughs> I'm going to get this answer. The comment on here. <laughs> oh well, there are two things that, like, I think are are are, are very important for Armenia right now. And also, uh, although Harold only mentioned about like the women's quota, but I think the entire uh, the, the entire electoral system, the changes in the system that are happening, and the fact that like we had free and fair elections in in in, uh, in Yerevan uh, a few days ago, and the early parliamentary elections are expected uh, expected to happen uh, next year. Uh, if if they are free and fair and be uh, really um, um, realize that like we no we no longer have that dis distrust in elections that we had before. It's it's a very important structural change, I think. Like having trust in free and fair elections and also like having the political will which yeah we have and so I definitely uh, actions and very important actions have been taken uh, in, towards that goal. And the second thing that is very important uh, I think um, um, before the Velvet Revolution, we had an um, um, oligarchic uh, economy in Armenia. We did not have a free market. And uh, the, this new administration is working um, to, ten, to change that as well. And now I could say that like, there's no, there, the, the, the rules of the game have changed and there's no oligarchy now. Although the previous oligarchs are still there running their business, but they don't have like any monopolies anymore and the, the market is free and I think it's, it's also very important. Great. Um, uh, let me answer in terms of um, uh, the risks that all democratic transitions face. So democratic transition is one phase, consolidation is a whole different ball game. In terms of uh, risks, authoritarian reversal is, a, as, I already, as I already discussed, is definitely a real factor. Um, several, uh, and that applies for Armenia as well. Um, the key, uh, the key here, I would say that democratic dividend uh, needs to be delivered, and I realize that the expectations are really sky high. In uh, my favorite source of data collection, taxi drivers. Every taxi I took this summer, I would ask, "Well, why were you? Why did you participate? Was it for the values, or was was it?" I actually wouldn't ask them. So, why did you participate? And in my mind, I'm thinking, "Are they going to say because I won my voice, democracy, or it's going to say I didn't have whatever to say? Is so jobs, 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 high levels of poverty, inequality?" Um, by and large, I don't even remember a case when they would cite economic factors. So it was, it seems, I don't know, very unscientific uh, data shows that people were, and Anush might be able, was on the ground, checking out, probably provide a better answer than I do, that people are, were there for the values. But that does not mean that economic factors do not matter. Poverty levels are still high, income inequality is still high. These are known to be stressors. For democratic as well as economic uh, as well as authoritarian states, so democratic dividend needs to be delivered. The fact that uh, uh, the market is becoming a little bit more competitive, it's very important and it's good. He did not Nikol Pashinyan and his government they promised that they will not go after the oligarchs, but that they are uh, making them accountable, trying to get them pay their taxes, even looking back as to how much they did not pay. So there are a lot of stuff that is happening on the ground. Um, 
the fact, another risk factor is that uh, I mentioned that uh, Pashinyan is an institutional hostage, meaning he has doing a great job in trying to work with the author within the authoritarian system, within the existing constitutional order. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, I just he hasn't been tested yet. How far he will go if he does not get the snap elections? Will he continue going through the constitutional route or not? Another important one, and I think he's sticking to it, the multi-party politics needs to be nourished, cherished, supported. Um, while the elections for Yerevan mayor were exciting, 80%, I mean, this is really a, a political marvel. I mean, Nikol Pashinyan had a tiny, he was a very small party, few votes in the parliament, and within this, essentially, his support, his base, he did not have much of a party, his base came from the mass mobilization. But within this period, essentially, everyone was switching to, to, to his political party. On the one hand, it's exciting, that's a lot of political capital, uh, but many people I talked to on the ground were worried that we don't swing to another, that the pendulum does not swing the other way. Um, I, I think the other parties probably will definitely need some time to rebuild. I think all of the political parties are going through an identity crisis right now, and hopefully things will balance a little. Uh, the fact that Armenia is a parliamentary democracy in general, it's better for nascent, weak democracies as opposed to presidential elections generally, so that's good. Um, one thing that they have been crystal clear on doing from the beginning is taking politics out of the educational system. Um, how we talked about the electoral uh, uh, regu irregularities or on the election day. Um, uh, an equally important problem is that when the election is fixed before and the use of administrative resources, including the educational sector, using public, state institutions of higher education, the school system, the teachers, telling them how to vote. Um, so they are very crystal clear on getting politics out of, I'm very excited that this is happening. The Minister of Education even called on parents, to, I mean, they were so excited about the revolution. The, the, my 13-year-old my, my, uh, wanted a Dukov hat, which they got, very exciting, even, but there are the notebooks with the Dukov logo, they're on the market. So the Minister of Education is very impressed, he called specifically on parents, saying, please do not buy those notebooks for your school. And I think that is quite telling. That, that's quite telling. Um, uh, and ultimately, I would hope that any transfer of power continues to be done through the ballot box, and that while the civil society social bases were so important in pushing Amer Armenian democracy forward through still existing authoritarian institutions, uh, but I'm hoping we need essentially at least two peaceful transfers of, the transfers of power via the ballot box. So, so that's my hope. That's where we're headed so far. So. Okay. Great. Wow. Okay, so we did, we lived up to our promotional materials. We have now given the people what they wanted. So uh, we are, uh, I, I want to open it up to questions, but I do, I did promise that there was a question that I wanted to ask, which was about gender. And actually, I'm very curious about how the gender dynamics that were in play in the revolution, whether the, that hopeful feeling of uh, women participating in the government and in the revolution, if that has continued in these last six months, it seems like with what you were saying, Haru, that yes, that has now affected some change in the actual system. One in three instead of one in four uh, on the list has to be a woman. So that's fantastic. But I'm wondering, too, if on the ground, for example, Anush, have you seen women feel um, that hope? Has that continued in the last six months? And if not, what are some of the things that have affected it or, or vice versa? Um, so when, when after the revolution and when the government was formed, we actually were a bit disappointed by the proportion of women and men, men in the ministries because out of 21 ministries, we only have uh, two, two female ministers. But if we compare it now like to the previous to the previous administration and um, like lower levels, um, the deputy prime ministers or like 
be higher management, I would say. We have a lot more women now, uh, and we have women mayors. Uh, so I would say um, yes, compared to the previous, compared compared to the previous, what we had previously. Now there is uh, definitely changed, and a lot more women are now involved in the government. So, but like, it, it's still not enough. There, there is still need for improvement, and I think. Um, the, the new administration has to show like a lot more uh, willingness to involve more women. But also, yeah, the gender quota has um, has um, has increased. So yeah, comparatively, it's better, but could be could be much better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You want to jump in? Sure. Um, I want to, and I'm putting Stefan Pilikian uh, <laughs> on the spot, but when we were working on putting together the panel on the parliamentary elections last year, 20, was it 2017, uh, on the panel, we had this conversation. I remember this vividly. We had Sona Ibazian of Transparency International. She's the executive director of Transparency International who was on the panel, big NGO. We had a representative from another NGO who spoke, who was on the panel, EPA, the Russia Partnership Foundation. And I remember Stefan, and I think you also commented on it, Mark, uh, saying they're all these bright women, but they're all, in, they're all in the civil society. When are they going to have a chance? And that is very symptomatic, I mean, uh, reflective or telling how things were in Armenia. And thank God women were in the civil society, actually turned out because women were pushed out of the government. There were some women who were in the government, actually, who contributed to the authoritarianism that we have. We, we had, but um, many were predominantly women were leading some important international as well as grassroots NGOs, and being in the civil society, they played a key role. Just visually looking at uh, during the during the revolution, visually looking at the squares, the streets that were being closed, Places where there were largely women, that there were women present, present, they were real easier to defuse. The tension with the police, clashes with the police would de-escalate quickly, which is supported by the data. In general, participation of women in such protests is a, a kind of tends to be linked that they're more likely to be peaceful. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, that, that, that's all I'll, I'll have on, on gender for now. But and yeah, just one more quick point impacted transitions like this. It is unfortunately has been the trend that women play a key role in pushing transitions and pushing revolutions, but when it comes down to who gets what, women are left out. Uh, this was the trend in Armenia as well, so hopefully it will, it will get corrected. But there's some top-notch women in the parliament. But. Yes, great. Great. On that really hopeful note, uh, hopefully we will get more women in the government and uh, leading the country. So on that hopeful note, I'll, leave, I'll open the questions up to the audience. And uh, we have the next fi uh, 10 minutes or so. We want to keep us on track. So we have a question up in the back. And actually, uh, let me see. If Try speaking out loud. And if we can't hear you, we'll yes, bring the mic up. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I am uh, Father Shetelli. I'm the pastor of uh, St. Gregory Armenian Church in Springfield. So I, I went, I was so inspired that in, in uh, April 24th, I got to Yerevan. I was there until May 5th. So I can confirm what uh, the lady from uh, uh, Amush. Amush, sorry, she said. And I will say also talk about the role of the, of the youth. They had a major role. And I could see, I, have, I haven't been in Armenia after 2001. And it's a big difference. This is the generation of the internet, of Facebook, and they don't afraid. Because what's the older generation had, legacy of Soviet Union, they had, they, they always easily, they, they, the government could make them afraid, you know. So the new generation doesn't have it. They are free, internally free. The second thing that I would like to say, uh, that uh, one of the biggest reasons, I think, the major reason that this happened, uh, that uh, uh, was that uh, Ser Sarkisian, in 2014, when they were just starting to discuss the new constitution, promised that he won't be prime minister or president, whatever. And Armenians are proud people, whom I asked, whom I asked many, 
mentioned me the, this, you know, that he lied to us. And in those days, that video, there is a video is saying this, there was in the internet. They put it again and again. So, and the third thing that I heard recently, recently, I think Tatu from uh, a Civil Net. Tatu Hakopian. Yes. He said that there is a danger. I mean, he's saying we have to be careful. This happened to uh, Levon Der Bedrosian. He elected fairly in 1991, 1990, but 1996 was a big first fraud election in Armenia. They push it by force, you know. So they say we have to make careful that this government, and I'm a big supporter of Pashinyan, I'm not saying bad thing, you know, but just make sure that he will not uh, disintegrate it. I mean, be careful that watch it, that if uh, he will go down the popularity something, the next elections also mm -hmm. will be fair and that will be an yeah. honor. Okay, so if, uh, maybe what I, I, I'll think, I think the second part of your question about uh, the youth, the how the youth were participating in this movement and whether maybe what, what has happened since in the last six months, if that youthful uh, exuberance, what has happened to that and where the youth has uh, moved in governmental uh, or administrative positions. Uh, that's one question. A, a possible other question here might be about, yeah, what is the longevity of this? Uh, how can we ensure that this revolution's uh, hopeful and transparent uh, parts of it continue for long term and don't fall into what maybe happened in previous uh, regime changes. I'll try to answer. So yeah, I definitely agree that you've had a major role to play. They were like one of the, the key actors in this movement and especially like students from colleges and like pupils from high schools. And to answer the question if uh, uh, about like their later involvement in the government, I would say that yes, a lot of the young, uh, young leaders of the movement um, were appointed to like important positions in, in the administration. So I would say that like their participation was indeed, uh, indeed appreciated. Uh, mm, I guess even like if you, if, if I tried like to compare it to 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 women's uh, uh, to women's situation, I would say that like that young people were more promoted than than women. Women, yeah, they were more appreciated than women. But um, yeah, and the second question. What was the second question? Uh, maybe more thinking about the the way that this revolutionary spirit and the transparency oh, yeah. that emerged out of it can be uh, fostered and protected uh, in the face of corruption or, or sham elections? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult to answer that question because it takes time. We can't, we can't predict what's going to happen like in, in two years, in three years. But my hope is that and my impression is that people, it, it, yeah, although Nikol Pashinyan st started in his personal like charisma and his personal leadership was, was very important in this movement but still like I think that like people tasted victory and they tasted uh, and, and they tasted um, like the power they felt powerful so I think if if next time um, elections are rigged and we see um, abuse of power people would not tolerate it it's just my personal impression it may be too personal I'm not sure, but that's, that's what I think. <laughs> uh, and I just want to add to that, uh, one very interesting thing that was different in 2018 was, uh, so not only did people have Facebook accounts, but people had it on their phone. Uh, and so Telegram actually uh, was a very important uh, organizing tool. There was a Telegram channel that said this is what's going on. and so. Uh, sort of breaking the the media uh, gatekeepers, uh, which we've seen uh, cause a lot of events around the world, particularly the, the Arab Spring. So sometimes Facebook and Google they get this bad rap of you know promoting uh, extremist things, and 
Uh, on the other side, uh, we, we should remember, maybe it's not a good idea for the state to, to regulate uh, different types of media. And as long as that's free, so for example, Telegram is blocked uh, in Russia. Um, I know in, in, uh, in other countries, a lot of these social media sites uh, are blocked. That that's never been the case in Armenia. And as long, I think, if you, if you hold that uh, free, then if things go the wrong way, at least people can tell you about it. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Okay. First of all, EVN Report is the best source for you. <laughs> EVN Report. Just listen to all the it's incredible. So, Go to EVN um, Report's Facebook page what, and like it. The oligarchs aren't going anywhere. I know that they've been arrested, but they've stolen you know, millions and millions and millions. So, um, what are their strategies going to be? They're not going anywhere, yeah. are they? I mean, Hopefully not, them. though. I mean, they do. Um, what was the question? Uh, what what, what to do about these all The question of them. really is, what are the dangers for stopping the revolution? Uh, what are the oligarchs who aren't disappearing going to do moving forward yeah. to uh, keep their power? I, I, I think that if the on the political realm, if the reforms continue the way they have, um, I can, let me just say that I do not have data. I'm speculating based on observations that I've seen so far. So, and I'm meaning that I don't know whether uh, some of the major oligarchs are trying to work with the Republican Party. That's where the linkages are. Whether they will work, continue to try to work with the Republican Party to make things difficult in getting to snap elections. Uh, so they probably will judge. Let me just say that, that if you might recall, uh, Pashinyan was voted in a parliament after a second try, and, and, and I kept saying that it's the businessman, whatever the term, businessman, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, there was a oligarch, uh, no, uh, politician business, no, members of parliament business. There's actually a term for it, meaning that it's okay to have your business, large business leader, a large business and be members of parliament. And I was thinking, they're going to be the first ones who are going to flip because they're not ideological. They have, the stakes are high, and people using, again, because this was a non-violent, peaceful protest, disobedience, they boycotted their uh, uh, big chains. Uh, and it was jarring to see the big uh, grocery store that is always full with people on the days of transition, not a single soul was shopping in it. So I think my, my thinking is that they will try to adapt. And Pashinyan has been wise to say, I'm not going, there's not going to be, there's not going to be property transfer. We're not touching what you have. We just ask that you pay, you fill the coffers. The Western donors are not rushing to provide financial support, at least not, for, not yet. And that might be a good thing. And Russia is in no rush to support this democratic transition. So the current government is definitely looking for alternative ways of filling the coffers and uh, looking at the diaspora as one well strategy, but also internally to generate the capital, trying to get these businesses to start paying taxes, and in some cases opening investigations for previous uh, tax evasion, etc. So that's what's happening. There is a path for them to adapt. Uh, there is a path for them to go along. And I think that's a that, that path is there, and I and uh, there if political if political if things go the way they should, the way we hope that they would, they will definitely adopt. It is I have not looked at other cases of corruption and the role of oligarchy in other parts of the world, so I don't want to comment more uh, on this. But the fact that many economies, such as Ukraine's economy, eighty percent is in the hands of oligarchs. Some like a few years ago, I saw 60% for Armenia. But the fact, as long as the small and medium enterprises are allowed to breathe, um, that will generate. Armenians are very talented, resources people. They will, they will take care of themselves. Okay, so we have so many questions, and it is, uh, it is nine. I, I think in some ways. What do you think? Should yeah. we just keep going? Yeah. If you're willing, we can keep going. I'm, it, this is great that there are so many questions. There's actually a question up, up, up in the no back. No, it's uh, The second from the back. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for being here today and giving us your insight. 
Um, I just had a question about elections, and I know in the past there have been uh, ballots cast on behalf of people that are dead or people that are no. What is your um, input on that, and is there, are there any changes being made right now about that? Uh, certainly. So, uh, particularly, so you mentioned some people that might have died. Particularly, there are a lot of Armenians that uh, the day of the election, whether they move permanently or whether they work uh, temporarily outside of Armenia, are not in the country. Uh, and so, one of the proposals uh, was, uh, and they, use, they use the word, or I use the English word, pur purging of the voter lists. Uh, so in, in the U.S., this is a very sensitive subject of, you know, making it difficult for people to register to vote. Uh, but basically, uh, one of the proposals is if someone hasn't, like, renewed their, their voter ID card. So voter, so individual ID um, is not mandatory in Armenia, and it has a 3,000 tiram, like, $10 cost. Um, uh, so there was this question of, you, so you need an ID to vote. You need either a passport or you need uh, an ID card to vote. Uh, and so there was this question of, are they going to uh, provide free IDs like the month before the election uh, for people to make sure that they can be on the list? Uh, and, and the thinking was that if someone had died, if someone had moved away and they're not going through this process, uh, then the list would kind of get cleaned up. Uh, it's a difficult approach because every Armenian citizen has a right to vote in the Constitution. So even if they live in LA, if they fly in on election day, uh, they are allowed uh, to cast that ballot. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a very interesting thing, uh, so we just had the mayor's election on Sunday. Every single one of these uh, voter lists that are assigned uh, when, you, when you get your ballot are, are scanned and put online. Uh, and uh, like, I'm a big privacy guy. I have, I downloaded them all anyway, but uh, I have like every single Yerevan uh, residence, like name, birthday, and address, and their signature, and whether they voted. Um, so, Wait, so, quick question, why is that? Why, why it's for transparency, yeah. Uh, okay. I think it's a little bit excessive. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, if, if someone signed for this person that's born in 1904, uh, like, it, everyone will know that, like, a ballot was issued to, the, to that name. Okay, so, let's see. Let, let's say this is the last question. Last question? Okay. Uh... <laughs> Everyone. Um, I mean, we can talk more outside. That's right? tr that's true. In fact, we we definitely should and could uh, talk outside, where we will have snacks for everybody. Refreshments will be outside. So, uh, Danny, sure, Danny. Actually, I thought was like uh, an idea. What about a lightning round? So we have like thirty <laughs> seconds. So we can fit like maybe two questions, something quick. So I guess uh, my question is to uh, you, Harut, and also Anush. Um, I guess diasporans have come to accept that uh, the role of diaspora political parties in Armenia is going to be much less than we expected over the decades. I know the ARF, you know, is a little involved in Karabakh politics and, you know, a little bit in Armenia or was with the previous ruling administration. Uh, but there's a lot of these new political parties that we don't know about. I mean, we know the, the Karabakh clans, you know, Republican Party, the Sergis Party. We know that there's Tsarukyan's party. But Yelkin Luis is something that uh, is, is new to a lot of people, and especially, like, their cooperation. Uh, I know this is something that you mentioned you wanted to talk about. Uh, and I guess on, on Anush's side of things, to what extent have, like, NGOs or people you've been working with, uh, civic society, trying to get involved, uh, you know, co colleagues and whatnot, with these new political parties? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> so, uh, the diaspora's political parties as having a, a de decreased decreased importance in uh, Armenia, and the, what what role Yale Luis has is playing currently, and whether uh, the question for Anush was NGOs and whether the people in those have been pushing these new political parties towards different uh, agendas? 
Well, I would say um, in TRC in Armenia, do not like um, do not try to like directly influence like which political party should. Um, do not like try to support certain political parties. I would say, uh, yeah, because NGOs are supposed to be objective and yeah, not like directly involved in politics. But uh, I have seen a lot of uh, like people from uh, from NGOs and having NGO background joining um, these new newly formed political parties. Like for example, one of the. Uh, uh, major political figures in Armenia, Lena Nazarian, uh, also involved in the politics work for um, um, Transparency International. They are, uh, yeah, and also for HEDC. Uh, yeah, there are, there are also like other um, NGO people who join those parties, but like, NGOs themselves do not do not support any of the parties, just out of neutrality principle. Uh, and quickly, just in terms of involvement of the diaspora, there's a uh, rapidly growing community of uh, what are termed repatriates, so diasporans that have moved to Armenia for good. Uh, and in the, in the Yerevan election, uh, there were several uh, candidates. Uh, some of them uh, were born in Moscow, some of them were born in, uh, in the UK, and, and now they're, they're on the city council election, so they were in the, the different lists. Uh, of the different parties that competed. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna end it here. We are a, a few minutes behind, but but that's okay because we're gonna keep talking after this. So I just want to say thank you to our panelists again. Let's give them a. Right. <laughs> move our conversation and the questions that you still have outside where we will have snacks, refreshments for everyone. Uh, and we, again, thank you all for attending and hope that we can see you at future issues, uh, contemporary Armenian issues events. Thank you.